On the y-axis here, on the rows, I have what I'm calling learning paradigms. And learning paradigms are different ways of using the model to do something useful. And this is where reinforcement learning lives. So reinforcement learning is a way to take any model you want and do something with it. And so in today's class, I'm just going to go over a bunch of these different examples so we can kind of see a high level of what is going on. OK, so starting with the very first question of the class, uh, this one. I want to present it. And here are five different machine learning buzzwords, I guess. And four of them kind of go together and are related. And one of them is the odd one out. And I want to see if you guys can guess which one is the odd one out, uh, which one is like the other ones, which one is not like the other ones, uh, just for fun. Uh, so I'll give you a minute to do this. Uh, another fun thing about this mathematized platform is they're still developing it. And last term, they did not have this little timer button. But this time they do. Oh, maybe it's just counting how long it's been open. OK, never mind. So I have to use my own timer. OK, I'll do my own timer. Uh, so I'll start a timer here for one minute, because uh, 11 people have answered already. And then we will see what you said. OK. OK, and there's 15 people in the room, and there's 15 answers. So I think I'll just stop now. Normally, for the first year classes, you really have to have the timer beep a bunch of times before people do it. But OK, you guys are on top of it. Let's see what people said. So of these five topics, what did people say? Is the odd one out? OK, eight people said transformer is the odd one out. Five people said linear regression is the odd one out. Two people said reinforcement learning is the odd one out. Uh, Zero people said convolutional network, and zero people said fully connected. Uh, I guess maybe these two are very similar. So you're like, I can't, one of them can't be the odd one out, because they're like a group. Uh, so most, the majority of people do not have it right. It is not transformer. All right, so my question is, think about which one you think the answer is. Talk to the people around you. What do the other ones have in common? Try to figure that out. So the other four that is not the right answer, what do they have in common? And transformer. Uh, transformer is the type of neural network that is used in things like ChatGPT. That I'll give you. If you've never heard of a transformer, you think it's like the movie with the bumblebee. No, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the type of neural network used in ChatGPT. OK, so I'll let you think for a couple more minutes. We'll revote, and then we'll see if we can come to a consensus. What do the other four have in common? Try to figure it out. OK. Yeah, I know a lot of girls that the model is the progression. So I'm going to be assuming that's the reinforcement learning. I don't know if it's in terms of how it's trained. No, that's just the But you could have a much different example that's just like two parameters. This is just a stack to make Okay, I reopened it. So you have to put in your answer again. It deleted your old answer. You have to put in your answer again, even if you want to keep the same answer. Uh, unless you put in transformer, then you must put in a different answer because we know that's wrong. And I'll give you one more minute. Uh, I guess you guys are quite fast. Maybe we won't need the full minute if we get to 16 people. Okay, we're waiting for two people. So I don't know, should we give them the full 30 seconds? Okay, one person. 
Okay. Let's see what people said. This time, okay. Nine people are on linear regression. Six people are on reinforcement learning. Why do you guys think re or, or linear regression is the odd one out? This was the, the majority winner, nine out of 16 people. Who can tell me what's different about linear regression? What's, what do the other ones have in common? And what is different about linear regression? Yeah. Linear regression is more of a stats concept, or it may be used for the other things. It's a bit more nitty gritty. Yeah. So I definitely agree with what you said. Linear regression is like stats, right? In stats 101, you learn linear regression, but you don't learn about these other ones. And uh, you said it's more nitty gritty, or ah, uh, okay. The reason it feels more nitty gritty is because in stats they go into the math of how they work, right? They do a lot of stuff. There's like inverses of matrices and all sorts of stuff. And that's because linear regression is sort of simpler, and you can do a lot of math on it. So you can do hard math on it because it's sort of simple. These other ones, like the transformer, nobody can do anything with it. You could just train it, you put it in a big million dollar computer, and you get the output and it works really well, but it's so big, it's got billions of parameters, nobody can like do math on it because it's too hard. So that's the reason that linear regression feels more nitty gritty than a transformer. But actually, linear regression and transformer are doing the same thing, and I'm going to claim that the odd one out is actually reinforcement learning. So the other four, even linear regression and the transformer, even though they seem very different, are actually both doing the same kind of thing. So now that I've told you the answer is reinforcement learning, and I guess six people got it right, uh, what do the other four have in common? Does anyone know? Yeah. They're all models. They're all models, exactly. So they're all models. What do, we, what do you mean when you say a model? It's not like uh, this is an important thing when you're Googling math things. Often you'll, you'll type in like, uh, let me think of a, a mathematician. I, I, okay, so there's a, a Brownian motion. Does anyone know the technical name for Brownian motion? There was a man named Norbert Wiener in the, in the 40s. So, so sometimes it's called the Wiener process. Uh, that's a model for things. But you should not Google Wiener model. <laughs> it, it will not work. So what, what, do you, what do you mean when you say model? takes in some sort of input and then outputs something. Yes, it has inputs and outputs. This is what you learn in Calculus 101. It's a function. So it's a function with some parameters or something. And we're saying the thing that we want will be described by this function. So all of these things are models, which is a nice way of saying they're parameterized functions, or they're a family of functions, and we're looking for the best one. What is reinforcement learning then, right? That's what this course is about. It's not these things. And I made a little chart. Let's see if I can get the chart to work of the different things. Oh no, it is not opening. Okay, let's try to open it. Ah, okay, here we go. I hit play. Okay, so here is a chart on the x-axis of the chart are the models. And those are the four models that I gave you already. So linear regression, neural networks, convolutional networks, and transformer networks. And so they're all functions. You can think of them as Linear regression is the easiest one. It's linear functions. So you, you do ax plus b. You vary the a, you vary the b. You get a bunch of linear functions. On the y-axis here, on the rows, I have what I'm calling learning paradigms. And learning paradigms are different ways of using the model to do something useful. And this is where reinforcement learning lives. So reinforcement learning is a way to take any model you want and do something with it. And so in today's class, I'm just going to go over a bunch of these different examples so we can kind of see a high level of what is going on. And I'm going to start with supervised learning. And supervised learning with linear regression is exactly what you do in STAT 101. You spend a lot of time on that. This is like your first example. So what is supervised learning and what is linear regression? Let's write it down. So let me see if I can get a little bit of paper. OK. so. So what is supervised learning? So some people don't even think of supervised learning as supervised learning. They just think this is the way you learn things. And in supervised learning, you have a bunch of x, y pairs. So you have x, i, y, i, i going from 1 to the number of examples you have. So you have x as an input, y as an output. And you're trying to make a function that maps x to y. So maybe a really good example is something like x is some information about a person and y is like a health outcome about y. Like do they 
do they have uh, high blood pressure or something, right? And you're trying to figure out if, given what we know about the person, can we estimate what they are? So we're trying to find, try to find the function, the function f, so that f of xi is approximately yi. And this is what you do in stats. And normally, we use parameterized functions. So we get a bunch of parameters. So we say, like, we have some parameters theta, and we're trying to find the function f theta, so that f theta of xi is approximately yi. And really, we mean, when we say find the function, we mean find the parameters. The parameters, right? Because if you find the parameters and you have your model set, then you know what the function is. OK, so this is the setup. What does it mean to try to find this is approximately that? Well, in practice, we minimize a loss function. We minimize, minimize a loss function. OK, and what you do is you define this loss function. You input the parameters, and the loss function tells you how bad your parameters are doing. And it says the loss function will be the difference between what f theta is saying and what the true value is squared, for example. So let's do f theta of xi minus yi squared, and we will sum it up over all the examples. And if you're feeling really nice, you'll also divide by the number of examples, so it's an average. So this is called the square loss, or the mean squared loss. The mean square loss. And now you have a perfectly defined mathematical way of saying, how do we find the best possible parameters? Well, we want the parameters that make the loss function as small as possible. OK. This setup with the mean squared loss, if you use a linear function, so you say f of theta. So this is the model that we were talking about before. If you use a linear model, f theta of x, if that is equal to the sum of, let's call it xj theta j, so if x is a vector and it has a lot of components, and you just take all the components and add them up, multiply by the parameters, that's a linear function, y equals mx plus b in high dimensions. Then with this model, this linear model, and the mean squared loss function, that is what you do in Statistics 101, where they talk all about multilinear regression and worrying about multicollinearity and all this stuff, and uh, figuring out the confidence intervals, the p-values, all that stuff is this setup. So it's a supervised learning with a very specific model. But of course, you can pick any model you want and do the same thing. So you have these two kind of ingredients, right? Like, what is the model you're using? And like, how are you actually learning about the stuff? And those two combine into giving you some kind of result. And so that example that's on the board right now is the Stats 101 example. But of course, there are many other examples. And I wrote, I think, some other ones. Ah, OK. The one I wrote is the MNIST character recognition problem. Uh, which I have also on the next slide. But so in the first row, it's supervised learning. If you use linear regression and supervised learning, that's stats 101. If you do it with a convolutional neural network, one problem you can do is to try to uh, label digits. And so this is a really famous uh, machine learning problem. You have these digits. I'll talk about the rest of the stuff later. But just to give you an example, you have these digits that look like this. And you want a computer program that inputs these digits and outputs what are they. And so you can have the same setup. Let me write it down on the uh, notebook. So that's one example. Example one. Let's do another example. Can I go down? All right. Example two. Uh, let's do if uh, xi is, a, say, a 28 by 28 pixel image. image so this, this is something that looks like this. It's got some pixels, and maybe it looks a little wonky. And yi is a number between uh, 0 to 9, a digit. Then you can try to uh, label the digits. And of course, you don't want to use the square loss function in this situation, because the square loss function is saying, how close is f to, to y? That would tell you sort of like the difference between the number and 0 to 9. You want to know, is the label correct? And so there's a slightly different loss function. Maybe I won't give you the details of the full loss function. So this was the mean squared loss function before. 
the loss function you typically use for this is the cross entropy loss function. And we don't need to know the details. Whoa. Okay. And the cross entropy loss function, again, it's some loss function. You tell me the parameters, theta, and I will tell you, uh, I will just average this thing over all of the examples. And I will do the loss function, let's call it lowercase l, between uh, what you think the answer is. So f sub theta of xi. That's kind of what you think. It could be, and what the true thing is, and you have this cross entropy loss function that you use. Okay, so if you know what the cross entropy loss function is, then this is familiar, but otherwise you just have to believe me that some other thing that measures how close is your guess. So if you think it's 90% chance it's a five, then you're doing really well if it's actually a five. Okay, so that's another famous example. Also in the supervised learning paradigm. This is a great question, great place to stop for questions. Comments? Okay, so of course the course is not really on the supervised learning paradigm. This is like the kind of thing we do in data science classes and stats classes. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Keynote, okay. Um, the course is actually on this reinforcement learning paradigm. And we're gonna get to that one, but I wanna tell you two other ones that are also people use, to, so you know it's not what reinforcement learning is. So in supervised learning, you have the X's and the Y's, that's supervised because somebody worked really hard to label all the digits. You had your grad students sit in the room for many days and label a bunch of images for you so you could get those Y values and use them. There is also unsupervised learning. And I'm gonna give you an, an example of unsupervised learning right here. So this is the same data set as before of the digits, but this time I'm not gonna use the labels. So I only have just the images and I don't use the labels at all. And what we do is we come up with a method to take a big database of images like this and map each image into a point in a vector space. This is called a latent embedding. And the way you do it is some fancy way called a variational autoencoder. And it happens, even though I didn't look at the labels, that things with similar labels get mapped similarly. And that's really useful. So let me show you. This is actually a little animation. And so here, the digits have been mapped into R3. So each thing got mapped into a vector, which is a three-dimensional vector. And you can see the labels are here. So zeros are red, ones are orange, and so on. And you can see that similar digits got mapped into similar regions of space. And so we did that without knowing any, anything about the actual digits. So you can imagine this is really useful if you want to do it with images of cats. You just go on Google image search and you say like, give me cat images. And then maybe you get a billion cat images and you do this and then you can learn something about cats. You're like, oh, there's a cluster over here. These are all one type of cat. This is a cluster over here. This is all a different type of cat. So you can learn something about the universe without having labels um, with this method. In this, this is a paper we wrote with a student here, uh, Griffin Flato, who's now at Toronto. Uh, and uh, the whole point of this paper was to try to do out of distribution detection. So if you have a whole bunch of images of digits and somebody brings an image of a cat, you want your computer to go, hey, that's not a digit, that's a cat. How does it do that? Well, it turns out we mapped all the digits to a sphere. And if you give me a cat, it will hopefully be not on the sphere. And then we're like, oh, you're pretty far from the sphere. You're probably not a digit. Um, so that was the point of this, this, uh, this paper. So it's a fun example, and you get some nice, nice things. And the nice thing is, you don't have to use any labels. This is a great, a great thing. Okay, so let me add this to our blackboard over here. Uh, so that was supervised learning. Let's do unsupervised learning. Okay, what do you do in unsupervised learning? You don't have x's and y's, you only have x's. So only have, only have x i, i going from one to the number of examples. And you try to, try to group them or do something with them to learn something about it. Try to group them, et cetera. So it's a little vague of what exactly you're trying to do. In the supervised learning, it was very clear what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to find a function that maps the x's to the y's. In the unsupervised learning, it's 
a little more ambiguous what exactly you're trying to do. But one example is find latent embeddings. Latent embeddings. So this is some function f theta of xi in some arbitrary space. In the example I gave, it was in R3, vectors in R3, so that these vectors tell you something about the x's themselves, right? So the x's on their own are hard to deal with, but f theta of xi is next. So this is an example. Okay, that's unsupervised learning. And supervised learning works really well. There's big, you know, all of statistics is really narrowed in on this, in this problem, and people can do a lot of stuff with it. You can find really good f's. You can find you can find guarantees that your f's are good and so on. But the problem is you need the y's, right? And it's kind of expensive to get the y's. So you need to pay somebody to give you the y's. Maybe you don't have a big data set. The nice thing about unsupervised learning is you don't need the y's. So you can get a big data set from Google just by searching. But there's kind of like less you can do. It's not as specific. OK. Well, there's one thing in between, which is self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning. And this one is important because this is how language models these days work. So this is how ChatGPT works, basically. And in self-supervised learning, you basically take an unsupervised problem and you convert it into a supervised one. So it's kind of like a little magic trick to convert. Take unsupervised, supervised, and convert, convert to supervised. So you have some kind of like method to take a bunch of x's with no y's and generate, without having a human come in, just automatically generate some kind of synthetic y's for what would the y values be. And then you go back to this loss function and you try to, try to find the, the function f that matches the y's. So what is this method of inventing y's? Method to invent y's. Okay. And it sounds like a really dumb idea. You just cover up part of it. That's the whole idea. The method cover up. Cover up part of x. That's the whole method. And let me, give, let me show you in a picture. So I made a little slide here. So this is from a really nice guide called the Illustrated Guide of word to vec So word to vec was like ChatGPT's great-great-grandfather. Okay, there's a really simple model that assigns a latent vector, just like we had for those images, to every word in the English language. But how does it work? So the first step is you go online, you download Wikipedia. Okay, so and by I don't mean I'm I mean when I download Wikipedia, I mean you download every single article, you make a big text file that has all the text of Wikipedia, and then you start going through the sentences. And okay, this is from the Wikipedia article on Dune, and in Dune, in the universe of Dune. You are not allowed to make uh, computers that look like humans. And that's because they had a big civil war and the, the computers killed a bunch of people and stuff. Okay, but anyway, so in, in the Wikipedia article for Dune, it says, thou shalt not make a machine, blah, blah, blah. And we take the sentence, thou shalt not, and we just cover up the not. Okay, so we have thou shalt blank. And good humans who know Engl the English language pretty well can guess that the word not is probably there. If you hear thou shalt blank, you're like, well, what should blank be? Because you have a good sense and you've heard it before, you know that not can go there. And it turns out we can use this as a kind of supervised learning problem. So we say, these are the x's, thou shalt. And the y is what we covered up. We covered up the word not. And if the computer can correctly guess the word that goes there, that means the computer is making progress towards understanding the English language. And that is self-supervised learning. So you just take a big data set, you cover up parts of it selectively, and you have the computer try to guess the parts you covered up, given the parts you didn't cover up. And if you do that enough, then you can get really powerful machines. So if you do it with a really simple model, a, like a one layer neural network, that's word to vec. And if you do it, this exact setup, with a really fancy transformer neural network, that's chat GPT, basically. OK. And actually, OK, I shouldn't say it's chat GPT. It's just regular GPT. It's GPT-3 or GPT-4. I'll tell you what chat GPT is in a second. OK, uh, let's go back to my big table. So now we've done like a speed run of the first three rows of the table, right? And I've given you a bunch of examples. So linear regression, you can do it in all three settings. I only told you in stat 101, but of course you could do it in any setting. 
It would not work very well for language modeling because it's kind of like wimpy. Like linear regression is not flexible enough to tell us how the English language works. If you want to do really fancy English language stuff, you can get a GPT language model with a big transformer network. I should have said if you do a one layer network, you'd get word to vec. So word to vec should go right here. Do I have a button to write on the screen? I do not. Okay. So word to vec could go here. Um, okay. So supervised learning, unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning are all different ways of learning things. Okay, any questions or comments about those things? So now we're gonna spend the rest of the course on the last row and the rest of today on just some examples. What could reinforcement learning be if those are different things you've thought about? And reinforcement learning, it adds this really different idea that does not appear in any of these. It adds the idea of having an agent who can take actions. That's the only difference. So in all of these, we just had X's and Y's, and you like look at the X's, you look at the Y's, you're like a passive observer, right? In reinforcement learning, the big twist is that we imagine that the system that is looking at the X's and Y's can also influence the X's and the Y's. It's an agent. So let me write this down. So this is the big, the big deal about reinforcement learning and what it is. Uh, yeah, I feel like reinforcement learning is a weird name for it. It should have been called like agent-based learning or something. So this is the new idea, the new thing, the new thing. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the new thing is actions. Let's let's say agent can take actions. So instead of being a passive observer and passively observing the x's and the y's. The system you're training can affect the X's in some, some way, and that can matter. So the three ingredients, formally, and we're going to give a more formal definition later, but this is the very rough definition, so you can understand the examples. There's three ingredients, and one ingredient is the state space. The state space. And the state space is, where is the agent now? Where, where are we now? And I'll give you an example of that in a bit. Where are we now? What is our state? A good example would be if you were doing a robot arm, the state space would be like, where is the robot arm pointed, right? Like, what is the angle of all its joints? How is it configured, right? That might matter if you're trying to train a robot arm to do something, you want to know where is the robot arm. Now, the set of all possible places it could be is the state space. And number two are the actions. You have actions. What can we choose to do? So if you're a robot arm, maybe some of your joints have motors and some of them don't have motors, right? Or some of them have springs or something. So the actions would be like, which motors can you turn on or off? And like, how powerfully can you turn them on or off? So state space, where are you now? Actions, what can you choose to do? And last but not least, this is the most important thing, are rewards. Rewards. What do we want to do? Want to do. So if you're a robot arm, you can imagine maybe your goal is to screw in a screw on the car, you're on, a, on an assembly line. So you get a reward of say plus one if you screw in the screw correctly, and you get a reward of zero if you don't do anything else. So the rewards kind of encode what you wanna do. The rewards are very similar to the reverse of the loss function, right? So the loss function was telling you how bad are you doing? The rewards are the opposite. They're like the thing you want to do. So they're, they're kind of playing the same role as the loss function. So that's very roughly what reinforcement learning is. It's these three ingredients and how do you train systems to maximize the rewards. So you're given some system that does these things and you wanna figure out in what way can we make sure, find the right function to maximize the rewards. And I'll give you a bunch of examples now of these things. Let's go to the table and I'll tell you the, so these are three real examples that are like real papers. Uh, one is how Lyft matches drivers to riders. So when you call on Lyft and you say, I wanna, I wanna drive somewhere, then Lyft has a big database and a big server that matches you up with a driver. You can imagine there's a bunch of people looking for rides at the same time, there's a bunch of drivers. How does it figure out who to send to what? The other example I will give is AlphaZero, which is a program that does, plays chess and go really well. And finally, I'll talk about ChatGPT itself, starts with the GPT language model, and then it does something to upgrade it 
So the GPT language model is really good at filling in the blank, and ChatGPT is really good at answering your question. So how is it different? And I'll talk about that as well. And again, you can use any type of model you want, right? So the thing that makes it reinforcement learning is the way we're training it, the learning paradigm, and the actual model itself could be anything. And in fact, the Lyft guys, they do a really simple thing. They literally do some kind of version of linear regression. To be fair, they have a lot of features. So it's a big linear regression, but they really do linear regression. And the big thing that, that is new to them is how they incorporate reinforcement learning. OK, so I'm going to start doing examples. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like the universe you put your model in, right? So it's like, what is, a model is like trying to find, it's like the, the model is like the space of possible functions you could find, and like how do you find the right one? And the learning paradigm tells you, what does it mean to find a good one? Or like, what method are we going to use to find a good model? If we're using supervised learning, we minimize the loss function. If we use reinforcement learning, we maximize the rewards. So it's kind of like, what universe does your, loss, your model live in? in some sense. Yeah, great question. Anyone else? OK, so we're going to do examples. Before we do these three real examples, I did the robot arm example, but let's do a little more specific of a fun baby example. And that baby example is blackjack. OK, blackjack is the perfect example of a reinforcement learning problem. So what is the state space in blackjack? That's like, what situations can you find yourself in in blackjack? Maybe I should take a poll here. Who's played black? Who knows roughly? It's okay if you don't know exactly. But like, you know, like, did you follow? When you watch The Hangover, did the blackjack scene roughly make sense? What they're doing? Okay, most people. All right, good. So in blackjack, you're dealt two cards, and the dealer is dealt two cards, but one of the dealer's cards is face down. Okay. So what is the state space? Well, you're the agent. You're the person betting. The state space is what you can see. It's your cards and what the dealer has. So you, here I have a6, and the dealer is showing a 6. That is a different situation. I'm in a different state than if I had a6, and the dealer was showing a 7. Maybe I take different actions in those two different states. Okay? And in blackjack, you get to choose what you want to do. The main things you can do are stand. That means you stop getting new cards, and you just stop with what you have. Or you can get more new cards. That's called hitting. Okay? And in blackjack, your goal is to get as close to 21 as you can without going over. If you go over 21, then you bust, you lose. But if you uh, uh, are under 21, then you want to have the highest hand. So higher than the dealer, but under 21. So that's why you might want to hit and get new cards. There's some other complicated moves, like doubling. Doubling is like hitting, but you get you double your bet. Splitting is also some silly thing, but don't worry about that. Okay. So basically, you can choose. Do you want to stick with your two cards, or do you want to get more cards? And if you get more cards, there's a risk you'll go over 21. But there's also a chance you will improve your hand so that you can beat the dealer. And you have to decide what to do. So in any situation, it's your choice. The dealer will look at you in a real life casino and say, what do you want to do? And you get to choose your action. OK. So that's the state space and the actions. And the reward, of course, in, in blackjack is money. You want to maximize your money. You win the game if you have a higher hand than the dealer and are under 21. And otherwise, you lose the game. And you lose your money. So you want to. Uh, Maximize your money. So it's very clear what your reward is. It's very clear what your actions are. It's very clear what the state space is. Any questions or comments? OK, yeah. Uh, what's the value of base one? Ah, this is a great question. In blackjack, this is a, you remember I said there are some stupid rules. One of the stupid rules is that ace can be 1 or 11. So an ace is actually very good, because here, uh, this is 11 plus 6, so you're at 17. But if you get delta 5, you can just be like, oh no, I meant that ace was a 1. So, so ace is a variable thing. So real blackjack in an actual Vegas casino has a bunch of these silly, weird rules. Uh, OK. This is good to know, because your final project for this course is going to be not real blackjack, but math blackjack. OK? And you're going to make an agent that plays math blackjack uh, a lot of times. So you'll eventually have to learn this. But this, is be the, this will be the first example in the course and also the final project. OK, so what does reinforcement learning do? Is you can play a bunch of times. You can see what's happening. And reinforcement learning will take all this stuff 
and you, you use a reinforcement algorithm correctly and well, you can convert it and learn the optimal actions. So you can figure out for any situation, is it better to stand or hit, right? And people have done this, and you can buy these uh, little cards that tell you what is the optimal action depending on what the dealer is showing and what you have. So this is a card. Every single square here is a different state in the blackjack universe, the state we are in, ace six, and the dealer is showing a six. So the dealer is showing a six is here, and ace six is this column. So ace six. Hmm. So it says the optimal action is D. D means double. Double means you get one extra card, and you also double your bet. So you're quite confident you're going to win, so you double your bet. Uh, OK, so this is like the kind of thing you'll be doing. I'll tell you the rules of the game. They're going to be kind of like this, and you're going to have to figure out what are the optimal actions. And for regular real-life blackjack, you can go online and download it. For the special blackjack we're doing, you have to do it yourself. OK, any questions or comments about this example? So if you understand this example, you understand what reinforcement learning is kind of at a high level in principle, and then the rest is going to be just details. Questions? OK, let's do the first real life example. In this example, it came out in like 2016, 2017. And this is one of the things that got me excited about reinforcement learning, is this program, AlphaGo Zero, that is better than humans at chess and Go, and it learned to play chess and Go just by playing itself over and over again using reinforcement learning. Let's ask ourselves, what do you think the state space actions and rewards would be if you were trying to make a reinforcement learning setup to learn chess or go, what would the state, state space actions and rewards be? Let's write these down. OK, so example one was blackjack. Blackjack. Uh, should I write down? OK, well the let me not write down the, the state space rewards and so on, because it was already on the slide. But for chess or go, so two player games where you're playing against the enemy, so what is the state space? That state space equals question mark, actions equals question mark, and your reward is what? So who wants to guess? What is the state space? Let's, let's do a vote. Put your hand up if you know chess. OK, almost everyone knows chess. Put your hand up if you know go. Only a couple of people. Let's do chess as our example. <laughs> OK, so imagine you're, you're trying to train a computer program to play chess using this reinforcement learning <coughs> paradigm. So you got to come up with what is the state space, what are the possible things, what are the actions, and what are the rewards? What would the state space be? Yeah. Possible board states? Yeah, possible board states. <laughs> so this is the set of all possible board states. So anytime you have a board with some number of pieces on it, that is an allowed board state. I guess in chess, there's like some extra rules. Like there's always has to be two kings. Like the king can't be in check. Uh, do you need anything else other than just a picture of the board and all the pieces on it? Would that be it? Yeah. You need to know who's playing first in that position. Yeah, you need to know whose turn is it. So this is including, including whose turn. Any other information? So again, okay. basically you guys have got it. It's the board plus whose turn it is it. In chess, there's a couple extra tiny little things that you need. So the rest, the rest of this is like deep chess lore. If you don't follow this, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, if it's the first turn. Yeah, if it's the first turn. Uh, yeah, okay, I guess that's true. Yes. Wait, why do you need to know? If you know the board, right, you will know it's the first turn because the pieces are set up in the special first position, right? So you can just check. Although, there is something about first turns. Yeah. Yeah, maybe in the back? I wasn't going to say with the first turn, but if there's been a check in the king's move, then you can't castle. Yes, OK. So yeah, this is what, I, what you're going at. So it's, it's, has the king moved yet? Because if the king moves and moves back, then you're not allowed to castle anymore. And this is sometimes called the castling rights. So this is exactly related to, uh, to uh, if, it's, you know, if things have happened yet or not. So same with if you move the rook and move it back. So you need to know the castling rights. Uh, I think there's one other dumb one. Yeah, there's one other really dumb, like in the weed, like super nerdy chess lore. Yeah. Well, there's the pawn moves. You can move two or one, and then there's en passant. 
Yes, okay, so pawn moves two or one is okay because you can just look at where the pawn is. If they're on their starting square, then they're allowed to move two. So that one you don't need to specifically do. But en passant is the dumb one I was thinking. So, so en passant is some weird technical chess move where if the pawn moves in a certain way, then on the exact next move, so not three moves from now, but literally the very next move, the opponent is allowed to capture it in a certain way. And so you need to write down, is the en passant thing allowed? Because you cannot see just by looking, is it the move right after the, the thing? So on pass on. Okay, it feels too nerdy to write this down. Okay, on pass. Let's write it down. On pass on. I think that's it. Am I missing any? Yeah. I think you also have to count the number of moves since last pawn. Oh yes. Okay, this is true. So there's a move. There's a rule in chess that if nobody has moved a pawn for 50 moves, then it's a draw. Okay. So technically, you need that as well. How many? So right. Uh, how many moves? So if that counter gets all the way to 50, then it's a draw until last pawn. Okay, and I guess very technically for like three move repetition, you need all that too. Okay, but so essentially, let's, let's just say, it's essentially the possible board states plus whose turn it is it. It's all the stuff you need to run a game of chess. Okay, great, that's the state space. What are the actions? Yeah. Would it be the set of all possible legal moves on that turn? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it's it's just the set of all legal moves that you can make. So you know whose turn is it. You know all this stuff, like are they allowed to castle and stuff. And using all this information, you can compute what are the allowed moves. And the actions are all the legal moves. All legal moves. Amazing. Okay. So it's like you're making a chess robot, right? The chess robot knows the state space. It can figure out all the legal moves and it chooses one of them. That's it's choosing an action. And last but not least, what are the rewards? What should the rewards be? Yeah. Win or loss. Yeah. So the reward is actually just if you win or lose the game. And I think this is the very subtle part is that most of the game has no rewards at all. Most of the game you're playing and you don't get any reward. You get a reward of zero, nothing happens until the very end of the game. And right at the end of the game, that is when you receive a reward. And you receive a reward, if you win the game, you receive a plus reward. If you lose the game, you receive a negative reward. So I'm gonna say, and this is the subtle part, this is most of the game, you get a reward of zero. Most of game, so no rewards or, or losses for most of the game, but you get a plus one if you win, if you win at the end, a minus one if you lose, and we'll, we'll say a zero if you tie. Okay, and this is I think the amazing thing about these reinforcement learning algorithms is there's this entire period of no rewards happening at all, right? There's no signal the computer has no way to know if its moves are good moves or bad moves until the very end of the game. And at the end of the game, it's like, oh, okay, we won the game. So now I'll think back to all the things I did like 30 moves ago, and I will say those are good moves or bad moves. This reason is the reason it's called reinforcement learning. This is the reinforcement, is in reinforcement learning, you take some signal, which maybe is occurring much later, and you go back in time and you reinforce all the things you did. So you can imagine if, two computers are playing each other with this reinforcement learning setup. And at the end of the game, one of them wins, and it goes back and says, all the moves I made were great moves, so let's do that again, we'll reinforce those moves, we'll do those more. And the other computer who lost goes, oh, all the moves I made were so dumb, I gotta go and in my computer code say, don't make moves like that anymore. So that's the reinforce in reinforcement learning, it's this kind of like time travel situation where you take the reward that you only get at the end and you use it to spread it out throughout the game. Okay. Any questions or comments about the setup? So now let's see what these uh, guys at Google did. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is a little video. This is like a two minute video where this guy's like bragging about his uh, program and why it's so important. Uh, this guy is David Silver and uh, we're following his course pretty closely. So he gave a course at UC London and we're going to follow some of the things from him. Uh, but it's a fun video. Okay. Well, let me play the video. Do I have to? Uh, you can replace everything you said about Go with chess, if you know chess and not Go. The reason uh, sort of Go is more exciting, in quotes, uh, is because people had already come up with computer programs that beat 
all the humans at chess, right? So that happened in the like late 90s, uh, that really good chess programs came about. But until this AlphaGo stuff, uh, nobody could beat the best humans at Go. So Go is sort of like harder for computers to play than chess. But the same exact algorithm that they used for Go, AlphaGo Zero, they did it for chess and Shogi, which is a type of uh, Japanese chess. Um, and the same algorithm works on all three. And it just comes up with like superhuman performance in all three um, with this setup of having a state space actions and a reward. And the way it does it is it uses a neural network as its model function. So this is the setup that it has. And then there is some details about how this interacts with the neural network. So I've taken, this is a, a one of the figures from their paper. They have a neural network that is outputting of all the possible legal moves, which ones it thinks is the best move. So it assigns a, a, a number between zero and one to every single legal move. And if it says this move is 0.99, that means I think this is a 99% chance this is the best move. And it's updating that over time by using reinforcement learning. Um, and it's not that complicated. So I had a student, uh, Sam, uh, who uh, a master's student, who worked on AlphaGo Connect 4. So he did, he did this exact algorithm for Connect 4. And we came up with a, we'll call it superhuman performance in Connect 4 because it beat me and Sam. All right, so, uh, and it did it use kind of this exact algorithm and neural networks. OK, uh, so that is the kind of thing you can do with games. Any questions or comments about, about this one? OK, let's do some more examples. Uh, the next example. Oh, does it play the video next? OK, yeah, great. Uh, I learned. OK, uh, the next example, this is a paper from last year published by the people, the data scientists at Lyft, on how they used uh, reinforcement learning to match riders and drivers on the Lyft algorithm. And so here's an example from their paper. Imagine you have two, uh, yeah, okay, there's, these are the two drivers, A and B. And these are two people who have asked for cars at 6 p.m. and 6.01 p.m. And how do you match them so that it's optimal? Well, obviously you should make, driver A should pick up passenger number one and driver B should pick up passenger number two. But it's complicated because these came at different times and you don't know. And also this is easy because it's on a one dimensional thing. So in real life, it's much more complicated. So here's a map also from the paper uh, of San the San Francisco area. And it depends on time. So on the left is in the morning, on the right is in the evening. And it's a very different like calculus for who you match with who, depending on time of day. And at the end of all this stuff, so they had this reinforcement learning approach. Their state space is all the possible ways you can have drivers and passengers sort of arranged. And then your actions are who you pair with who. And your reward is how much money you make, I guess. So they have a little table here with like the results of their experiments. And they got $30 million per year worth of revenue by improvements with their reinforcement learning approach. And I think the really cool thing is buried deep in the bowels of this paper. It's all a linear function. So it's, it's kind of like linear regression, but living in a very complicated universe of all this reinforcement learning stuff. and. Uh, Okay, to be fair, there's these complicated features. So it's a linear combination of features, but the features are like, where in San Francisco are you? That kind of thing. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Uh, that this is like a real life application of reinforcement learning. Questions or comments about this one? Okay, and the very last example that we're gonna do today uh, of reinforcement learning in, in the wild is how do you upgrade GPT-3, which is that language model that's really good at filling in the blank, right? So you type in thou shalt, Blank, and it's really good at filling in not. How do you upgrade that to ChatGPT? And this is an example from the OpenAI website. If you take the original language model, GPT-3, that's really good at filling in the blank, and you say, explain the moon landing to a six-year-old in a few sentences. It's going to fill in the blank, right? So it's trained on all of Wikipedia, all of the internet, basically. And any time it saw a sentence, like explain the moon landing to a six-year-old, it's trying to figure out what comes next, right? And in this situation, if you say, explain the moon landing to a six-year-old in a few sentences, what does it output? It says, explain the theory of gravity to a six-year-old. Explain the theory of relativity to a six-year-old. Explain the Big Bang theory to a six-year-old. So it's filling in the blank as if it had seen a list of questions to give to six-year-olds, which is a very valid thing that you would see on the internet, but it's not at all what we want, right? So this is the question. How do you upgrade this machine that is good at filling in the blank to an actual useful assistant that will answer the question? And the way they did it is something called RLHF. Let me tell you what RLHF stands for. Let's write this down. So RLHF. The RL 
stands for reinforcement learning. So this is reinforcement learning. And HF stands for human feedback. That's the HF. So reinforcement learning with human feedback. And basically what they did is they said, we're going to treat this whole problem of coming up with good, prompt, good answers to prompts. We're going to treat it as a reinforcement learning problem where the rewards are human feedback. So that the, the system will output something and we'll give it to a, a human and the human will say how good it is and that's the reward. And then the machine will run on this whole algorithm of maximizing the reward using the hum what the humans say as the reward. And so if humans say it's good, then it's good and we're going to maximize that. Okay. And there's a more details on how exactly they did it. They did it. But this, this is, I think this shows you the flexibility of the reinforcement learning approach is you can put anything you want as the rewards. They don't have to make sense, right? They don't have to be some nice function. It can literally just be like whatever that dude feels like. That can be your rewards. And your system will still kind of learn over time what they like and, and how to maximize the rewards. So they had some complicated thing, right? They had to pay a bunch of labelers. So these people would, uh, would uh, take prompts like this and, and output uh, what they think ChatGPT should say. So they started with that. And then they had a system where the labelers were just putting in different possible answers in order of what they think is the best. Actually, sometimes when you use ChatGPT, it'll say, do you like this one or this one? And you're, you're being a free labeler for open ad. OK. And at the end, they, so they, they come up with a system, and they use this reinforcement learning algorithm to fix it. And then after all this work, after millions of dollars of work, and paying lots of people to label things and sort things, then it says things like this. People went to the moon, and they took pictures of what they saw and sent them back to the Earth. Great, great answer for a six-year-old. OK, so very like mathematically vague, but I think the cool thing is that you can make something as abstract as, do humans like it? That can be your reward. OK, any questions or comments about that one? Yeah? Yeah, that's right. So, so in this situation, right, I, I wouldn't say that reinforcement learning is supervised learning, and I wouldn't say it's unsupervised learning. I'd say it's its own learning paradigm where you have rewards. And depending on what the rewards are, it might be more like supervised learning. Like if you just pay people <laughs> to label things, and that, those are the rewards, then it's a kind of supervised learning. And if you do it in a different way, like in chess, right, when they were playing self-play chess games by yourself over and over again with the rules of chess, that's kind of like unsupervised learning. So it's up to you what to make the rewards and therefore what's going to happen. But that's the benefit of the flexibility of the system. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think this is the big this is the big uh, let me let me tell you what the big difference is. I think it's it really is the fact that you have actions that affect the state space and the rewards. So imagine if you're trying to learn blackjack. Well, you can learn blackjack without reinforcement learning by treating it as a supervised learning problem. Because what you could do is you could just say, I'm going to try each of these 25% of the time. We'll just play a million hands. And the state space in blackjack is so small that you will eventually try all the possibilities. And you'll be like, in this situation, I tried standing 100 times. I tried hitting 100 times. I tried doubling 100 times. Then I tried splitting 100 times. And the best one was standing. That would not work in a game like Go or chess. And the reason it wouldn't work in, in chess or Go is because the set of possible games is so huge, you would never try all the games. So once the state space becomes so big that you can't easily explore it all, then it's really important to select like, good actions to guide you to like, smart parts of the state space. And so reinforcement learning helps you find those optimal actions, which will then help you learn more about the state space and so on. The same problem in writing out sentences, like for ChatGPT, right? Like, you, one, you can't do this by generate random sequences of text and then score them. Because most random sequences of text don't contain any words, right? They're just like gibberish. And so like, if you give four pieces of gibberish to a reviewer and you say like, which one is the best? Which of these gibberishes is the best? They're like, they're all equally terrible. So it needs to be like, kind of okay to start with. And then it can learn better and better actions, which will lead to better and better uh, outcomes. So it is kind of like the actions are important for sure. Yeah? Just 
just for the, the last example, what did Lyft use as the rewards? Ah, so I, so this is a great question. I, I think they used as rewards. So the, the way their algorithm worked is they didn't act, their actions weren't actually who to pair with who. Their actions were some weights. So they said, how much would you prefer to pair A with one and A, uh, and A with two? And then there was some other algorithm on top that given the weights would actually do the pairing. And so I believe their, their final thing was something like uh, the, the, the value or something, like how many dollars the drivers got and then like how many dollars the, the uh, writers paid. Uh, but yeah, you have to read their paper to, to figure out. And this paper only came out uh, like a few months ago. So they've been using the algorithm since 2021, but they only told people about it last year. <laughs> so of course, you, they're, they're a private company. They can do whatever they want. OK, yeah, great question. Uh, anyone else? OK, so how are we going to learn about reinforcement learning in this course? We're going to start, we're going to do it the math way, which is you start with the simplest possible thing and you build up. So we're not going to jump into the left paper. We're going to go to what is the simplest possible thing we could do. And even blackjack, which is your final project, is too complicated. We're going to take state space actions and rewards. And to start with, we're going to only do state space. So no actions, no rewards. We're only going to look at how things happen on a state space. So we're going to come up with a game that's like blackjack, but you don't make any actions. And you might be familiar with these games from when you were a child. The example that I came up, up with is the game of snakes and ladders. So we're going to learn snakes and ladders. So snakes and ladders is like blackjack, except you don't get to choose if you stay or hit. You just roll the dice and like the next thing happens. Okay? And snakes and ladders is a perfect example of a state space. We're going to do this simple snakes and ladders thing. And I took this example from a really nice number file video. So I'm going to show you guys the number file video. And that's going to be our problem that we're going to work on for the last 10 minutes of this class and the first 10 minutes of next class probably. Uh, but let me play the actual thing for you. And I'll, I'll open it over here so it can be full screen. You know, have a pay transparency Ooh. plan but don't know how to get started? No, I don't. Let us help you put okay. your... Let me, uh, let me press this button right here. Their explanation of snakes and ladders. And we're going to do an example of this. So in the rest of the video, they calculate how many rolls it would take to go from 0 to 9, which is something we will eventually do. And they do it with this really slick way of using a matrix. And we are going to do that way. But for the last little 10 minutes here, I want to come up with just a simpler thing to show you why, where this matrix comes from and like why, who invented this matrix and why. So instead of just saying, here's the matrix, here's how it works, you do these crazy math calculations, you get the answer. I want us to work it out kind of by hand so we can like appreciate where the matrix came from. So the example problem I came up with, which is even simpler than the problem they're working on, is uh, this problem. So we're going to start at square zero. I want to answer the question. We're going to roll the dice three times. We're going to play three rounds of snakes and ladders. Uh, and by, by rounds, I mean three rolls of the dice. And we want to know what is the probability after those three rolls that you end on square seven. That's what I want you to figure out. And this is going to feel like a statistics 101 problem, like probability problem. How many ways can you roll three dice so that you end up on seven over here? And I'll give you like 10 minutes to work on it. Um, and I have a mathematized question set up uh, over here. Exercise two in the snakes and ladders from the video. So you might want to copy this down, right? So it's important that you know there's a ladder from four to seven and a snake from eight to two. But try to work it out. This will maybe de-rust your probability skills, which we'll use a lot in, in the course. OK, so go wild. Feel free to talk to your neighbors. Uh, and uh, I'll give you like 10 minutes, and then we'll see how far people get. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll draw it on the board. Um, yeah, let's copy it.
Eight is not a possible position because we line up A gone. So I think the best thing is, is to like just start okay, so yeah. is to like calculate the likelihood that we reach that's not true. Because if you like that. Yeah. I'm just thinking last year. I think it's important that you start because you can have So, so okay. this is like on the third roll or on six. Yeah. Yeah. So after you've rolled the third roll, yeah. you luck, yeah. and if you're on seven, then okay. that's good. Yeah. 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 So one, then 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 one, you can go past it by getting to eight. Go back to you know it's a step. You'll never reach. Oh, you can, you can. If you roll a four, that'll one. That'll put you back on two. Right, and then you go back up. And you should either get two or five. So it's just what? You can go to eight. So you can go to eight. So if you roll it, it's similar to ladder of fist. It'll be two by two. Then you go one. Back down to two. One. Roll it two. Four. Seven. Two. I have a question. Yeah. You if you're off, if you're, uh, say you're on like seven and you roll like a number higher than two, and you just stay on nine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, so for this, for this question, doesn't like it. You could pretend it goes on to infinity, and we just want to know you're at seven. So you can never go back. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. If the numbers more, one six for all of these, actually two six. If they sum to seven, but you can't land on the floor. Because I will throw you off. Oh yeah, the next like step three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you'd be six rolls. It'd be six hundred six. That's two more. Um, uh, uh, do you do it back? Maybe you start at any any point is that nine, and then from nine you have how many possible rolls to get to nine, which are there should be more to nine. Wait, no, we're trying to see if we get like what's the probability that we end up on sports stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Three rolls. Okay. So the probability is I mean, we have know that once we have the number, we can get it. I yes. But you know what? This is actually good because we have from the screen. So the side of the work is that you can use these. OK, so actually, you shouldn't be that bad. So you get from here, you can go three. You can go four, which is a seven. Um, yes. So this will be the other steps. OK, at one of you at zero. So we have two other things. Right. So the one at six is the one. Is he good? Because you can only get seven, five, six, seven. Oh, you're saying in one move? Those are the chances. Yeah, so from one, back to zero. Okay, but what? Oh, two out of six. You're going to one. You're going to You're going from one. 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 Uh, previous right rules, now, right? To get the, uh, so yeah, just figure yeah, out where you can be, which I think is two is probably yeah, yeah, anywhere. Yeah, you two is to agree. Say how many ways can we get to seven? You can go to, well, uh, yeah, you could be uh, anywhere. Uh, five, you can't be on the nine, six, seven again, or you can go to eight. Right? Yeah, um, so, <laughs> yeah, but you could work out. I want the number, oh, and then it's going to be divided by six uh, cubed. Yeah. So just the number of, really, really I want the number of ways. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're okay, so replace all of you. So if you get six, then three, you're done. You're at seven. And if you're on turn, then. 
Mm. Yeah, that's two. Ooh, you could never be at one. Well, yeah, you have six. Well, we end up on seven on step two. So you're then those are still on there. Yeah. Two. Actually, if we end up on oh, seven on step two, yeah. 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 if we end up on and seven on step two, our ability to see really that is. Yeah. So technically, yeah. So we can easily come up with a like a upper and if you're on the so there should be certain yeah, yeah, yeah. Of ways to get there. There's no so way the, to the get first way is just yeah. wrong. Yeah. Only yeah. get to yeah. if you're on the last track. Oh, Seven without getting any snakes and ladders. So and you, know, you can't be on the eight. The snake from four seven as your last one. You, can only you also get can't be on the four. Two and maybe yeah. yeah. seven so you can get snakes. Yeah, positions over the range of two, one, five, and six. Yeah. Yeah. If you're at any point, you get on eight. And then you can play it. So the thing is, he wants to be. He wants to be. Yeah, but he, what he's saying is that you can't yeah, be on the eight. Like, your piece can't be sitting on the eight. Because it's not even like you're sliding down. Like, that eight piece technically doesn't even need to be sitting on the eight. So we need to be sitting on the eight. Three, five. Eight. There should be certain chances go over here. And six. Those are the only ways. Yeah, four zero. Wait, those are the only ways you can get to seven. Wait, if we if we make it in, if we make it in the market, right? We can just say and then you the probability just, that we end up. Then we we have to know what the probability of based off of each of these on turn two is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, we can go so back from there once we. That we, well, the we probability just of landing on two is more. Just one in thirty-six. So yeah, just definitely becomes a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. you got to roll one. Uh, plus. Okay, wait, we can. So I mean, if, we're, like, if we're at one, yeah. we have a one, a one in six. Three. Two, we have a one in six. Two. Yeah. Sorry, no. So two and six. Two. From one, we have two and six. So two, two, we have two and six. From three, we have two. Uh, yeah. uh, two and six. Uh, from five, we have four and one. We can just set that up uh, to have the probabilities of our four. No, I think it's four as well because you have two combinations. One, four, and two, three. Because this is actually just down step two. These are all possible places you can land. And then you just kind of have to figure out from so with one roll back. Okay, we've got to be careful though. One, so two, if you're at nine, it's zero. We can't have four and two. There's a zero percent chance. If we hit four, we're taking the ladder. Right. Wait, if we start up, we ha our initial position I mean, is so like if we, if we say first, there yeah. are ten positions, we're going to end up on zero. zero. It would be one uh, okay, zero. So you're not including zero. You can't, zero. You can't roll four. So if you start with a four, it's not going to work. Four, five, six, if you start with a two, it's and then a four, four is good. Well, that's one. And then we have to and then get two threes. So that have to. Yeah. And then, like, not our A matrix or yeah. transition yeah. matrix. Yeah. We have to make it so yeah. one the last we have to, when we multiply the initial position, three three twice. Uh, so we get the probability There's only that, that can happen. Like, yeah, like, so like, like, we need to find, we need to get the right probabilities in here. Yeah. 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 We just and put that to the power. Five. 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 Sure. Two, yeah. Yeah. I think these are the positions. I think this is from the last case. Zero, zero, zero. These are all the probabilities yeah. from uh, the final case. One more left. Now we just so have seven, so that should be zero, zero. The only ones that are important. So, so it's just yeah, all the ones that are important. So it's six, five, and three, which is two. Okay, so there's like one minute left. Put in your guess. It's okay if you're not done. Uh, but try to guess like order of magnitude, right? So there's some number that is the number of ways. And the probability is that number divided by 6 cubed. Because each dice roll is, is chance 1, 6, 3, chapter. So guess roughly what it is. Uh, and also, it occurs to me, hearing some of your discussion, which was excellent, I think I made a mistake when I was calculating it. So I'm not confident the answer it says uh, is, is the right answer. But I'm curious, how, like, you know, if everybody is like approximately the same or what it is. And then we're, let's start listing the possibilities. Because um, this is kind of like how you imagine to do this problem is to list the possibilities. I guess I should do it on the computer. But um, so put in, put in a guess. It's OK if it's wrong. It's always OK if it's wrong. The whole point of this in-class stuff is just to like get us thinking and like so I can understand uh, where, what you guys are thinking about. So never feel bad putting in a wrong answer into these. Uh, oh, oh, it's well, always fine. Uh, yeah. So put in put in your guess, even if you're not done. And then I'll start I'll start writing down uh, rules that lead to seven, um, which I think some people calculated. Okay. Uh, so I have nine people so far. Ten people. Maybe I'll stop this when I get to twelve. Okay. 
There we go. I'm stopping it. Let's see what people said. Okay. So, one, five, nine, fourteen. Uh, can I see more of them, please? Fifteen, eighteen, twenty. Okay. So we have lots of different answers. Uh, great. Let's start listing the ways. So the point of this question is to get you thinking about this. There is a really nice, slick, sort of simple way to do it. That is the markup chain way. And that's like what they're going to show you in the video and what we're going to do next class. But I want you guys to appreciate why it's kind of an annoying, hard problem before I show you the slick way. I think that'll help you remember the slick way uh, faster. Did it just boot me off? Possibly. I think you made a good crack. Okay. Let's try turning this back on. Okay, so let's take of the ways to get there. I'll start. There are some easy ones, ways like ways you can roll the dice that lead to you being on seven. One way is if you just end up at four after three things. So there's a couple ways to end up at four. You can roll a one and a one and then a two. Or you can do a one, two, one. Or you can do a two, one, one. So those are three ways to end up on there. Let me write these on here so that it's in the recording. So I want to go all the way to the bottom. Uh, and so ways to do it. Ways. There's, this is like end at four. Right? And then the ladder will take you up to seven, so you'll be at seven. So there's one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, one. Okay. What other like genres are there for like things you can do to get to seven? I heard people discussing them. Yeah. You can do four, one, two. Four, one, two. So this is just like you roll and you end up at seven, right? Yeah. Roll. So this is like, maybe I, may I say like, uh, Instead of end up four, let me say sum to four. This is sum to seven. Okay. And four, one, two sums to seven. So it's like first you roll four, then you roll one, then you roll two. Four plus one plus two equals seven. So therefore you're on seven, right? And I think I had this one in my solution too, but there's actually a problem <laughs> with four, one, two. Who can tell me what the problem is? If you roll four, one, two, you don't end up at seven. Yeah. Yeah, if you hit the four, then it takes you up to the seven. Yeah, so after the first roll, you're at four, and then you get transported up to seven. And then after you roll one, now you're at eight. Oh, and then you go down to two, and then you go four. But then you're at uh, you need to five. It needs to be four one five, right? Because there are two options from the two. Okay, wait, hold on. Let's do it. Okay, so you roll a four. This is like we're playing snakes and ladders. Okay, you roll a four. One, two, three, four. Oh, I got a ladder. Okay. Then what's the second roll? One. Oh no, I got it here. Okay. Then what's the third roll? Two. One, two, okay, we're okay. I see. Yeah, so this is like a, this is a crazy way. So we have to use this is we'll not put this in the sum to seven category. We'll put this in the uh, triple triple slide category. Okay. And this is four, one, two. Okay, very good. So there's some mundane ways you can sum to seven and it will work that avoid four. So let's put sum to seven and avoid four. And avoid four. Okay, and I calculated this one when I was doing this problem. I did it using something called the stars and bars method. And you end up with something like seven minus one, choose three minus one, which is six, choose two, which is uh, 15 ways. And this is like the number of ways you can have three dice summed to seven. I can explain this in some more detail, but it's actually kind of tangential to the course. Uh, but I forgot to account for all the ways that have a four in it. Because if you have a four, then you go up here. So that's okay. So this is one thing you got to do, things like this. And it's going to be, there's some 15 minus some. That's going to be quite annoying. There's another genre of you could sum to eight in the first two dice rolls and then roll a five. That's another like category. Sum to eight and then roll a five. So this is things like uh, six, two, five. Uh, five, three, five. Four, four, five. Except four, four, five doesn't work because... You end up on the four in the middle. Okay, so again, quite annoying. Uh, three, five, five, that one works. Two, six, five, that one works. Okay, so you can add up all these things and try to like think of everything and like make sure you haven't missed anything. This will eventually lead to a solution. I believe there's like approximately 30 ways. Okay, so it'd be a fun exercise if you guys want to do it. There's a forum on for the course. You can post your solution on the forum and we can see if people agree. The whole point of this problem was to annoy you so that when I tell you the nice way to do it on Tuesday, you will appreciate it, okay? So on, on Tuesday, we're gonna learn a nice way to do it. 
Or you bookkeep everything, and you don't need to worry about all this stuff. You'll get the right answer. Okay, see you guys on Tuesday. <laughs>